King. Rise among us, let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise.
that there is no truer love more than that. And Lord, we thank you so much for it. Lord, we want to be open and, and vulnerable to you today during this time of worship. And Lord, as, as we prepare our hearts, Lord, for your message. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated if you'd like.
Lord, as we, uh, as we approach that, that morning where we, we all wake up and we celebrate your birth, Lord, we're celebrating it now. We're celebrating it every day. We just ask that these words to these songs would be a sweet-smelling savor in your nostrils, Lord, that our praise would rise to heaven, that you would be blessed by it. Thank you, Lord, that you've given us the ability to express how we feel, that you've given us vocal cords that we might sing and speak and pray to you. Thank you for that great gift, Lord. Thank you for the greatest gift of all for your son. And as we worship you, as we open your word today, Holy Spirit, we do look to you to teach us, encourage us, and enlighten us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So yesterday we did have a little Christmas bazaar down in the uh, Fellowship Hall. Um, Sherry, all the vendors that were there, we want to thank you for being there. And they had a silent auction too. You've heard me mentioning in the last few Sundays that we are, uh, we are in the process of putting together a uh, youth group here at the church. And in prayer that that will draw more kids to us and minister to the ones, the ones that we have. Um, so they had a silent auction yesterday, and the question was raised, what do we do with this? Do we just, you know, go buy new drapes for the kitchen, or what do we do with this, right? And they decided that they would want to give it to the unstarted as yet youth group, to kind of help them get started, they raised three hundred and forty-four dollars for that yesterday. So, yeah, that's very, very cool. Um, on December seventeenth, you'll be having a painting class here with Cindy Allen. There's a sign-up sheet. Hope you can uh, get signed up for that. Our church family Christmas lunch is also on December or Saturday. Yes, December seventeenth at one o'clock. Sign-up sheet in the foyer. We're providing the meal, so please bring desserts, you know, sweet stuff if you'd like. And again, I want to remind you, very important, we will not be having a Sunday service on Christmas Day. Instead, we're going to have a candlelight service here as we normally do. We'll be having it on Friday, December 23rd at 7 o'clock. So if you all want to come and bring friends and everybody you can think of, let's fill this place up and let's just really celebrate the uh, birth of Christ together on that Friday evening. And then Christmas morning, you'll all be able to be with your families and, and enjoy that day together. I always thought that our families were priority in our lives and we want to make that totally um, available for you guys. Now, if any of you want to just come out here Sunday morning and hang out, you're welcome to, but it might be kind of cold in here that morning. Anyway, that's all we got for that. Why don't we go ahead and we'll get started with our study this morning. If you would please open up to the Gospel of Matthew with me. So you ever go out and you apply for a job and, you know, one of the first things you might want to know about the job is what does it pay? How much am I going to make? And, and what are the benefits of the job? What kind of prestige and uh, just, you know, how comfortable will it be? And uh, all these different little perks that maybe we're looking for when we're looking for work in a sense. And... We find here in our text this morning, as we pick up chapter 10 and verse 16, Jesus is going to give them a little bit of an idea of what this job description will be like as they are called by God to serve as apostles. So before we actually read down through the whole text, I just want to share a few of the exciting benefits that might come from being an apostle in the time of Christ. So if we look at the beginning of the the, uh, text, you'll find uh, verse 16. 
It says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. We could probably deal with that. But now go down to verse 18. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. Verse 21. Now brother will betray brother unto death, and a father his children, and children rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Verse 25, it is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? And then verse 28, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So if I was filling out this application, and I would probably have to really go home and pray about this one. I would kind of wonder, okay, well, I'm looking for benefits, right? I really wasn't looking to lay in my life on the line. I wasn't looking to losing my family. And at first glance, you know, this doesn't really seem a very rewarding job. But I have to tell you, anybody, any of us at any time throughout any period in history who have, quote, unquote, applied for the job of serving the Lord found out very quickly that there are some fine print things down in there, aren't there? There is some persecution that goes along with it. There are difficulties that go along with it. And just because we're serving God doesn't mean we can necessarily just make out a wish list and send it up to Him and we're going to get them all granted. As a matter of fact, sometimes, as we see in Scripture, with most of God's representatives in the Scripture, they lost everything. They gave it all up. I, I hate to say they lost it because they willingly surrendered it, you know. If, if you're walking with the Lord this morning and, and you're struggling with something and, and you feel like, man, i got to give that up, like you're going to miss it or something, you know. And God's saying, no, I don't want you to give it up and, and kind of long for it down the road. I want you to surrender it. I want you to be glad to get rid of it out of your life so that you can open it up, so you can open yourself up. The blessings that God really does want to bless each one who serves him with all their heart. And so in the beginning of our text, it's interesting because he tells them right away that he's sending them out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Wow. Now, I know I see sheep around here once in a while. Not a whole lot, but some folk have sheep. But those of us that know anything about sheep, we know that uh, they're very defenseless animals. And they're not the smartest animals in the group either. You know? I remember my... My dad used to tell me years ago, well, if one sheep walked off the cliff, would you walk off with the other sheep? And, you know, I used to think, how dumb is that? <laughs> but there's a lot of truth to it. Sheep are naturally followers. And, and that's just part of what they are. Sheep can get lost very, very easily. You know... The, a lot of the pictures you'll see of Jesus, he'll have a staff, and then he'll have like a, like a little, like a, like a, almost like a cane. And, and sometimes these little sheep would need some disciplining, you know, little taps to keep them in line as they're going down the flock, right, in the, down the road. But then there were other times one might wander off and, and it might find itself caught up in the thickets and it can't get out and it's so dumb, it don't know how to get out. And its little fur's all stuck in the stickers. And you can imagine, not a very comfortable situation. 
And so the Lord has this, this cane type thing that he'll reach in there and he'll move the briars and he'll grab the sheep and, and pull them out and get them out of that thorny mess that they've gotten themselves into. You look at these two ideas and you think about how sheep can't fight. They, 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 they can't really, have you gone, ever gone up to a sheep and tried to attack you? Attack sheep, right? No, never. They're just not like that. Um, so why do you think that we're referred to as sheep? Does that insult you? Or is it just a fl- plain truth? We do need a shepherd, don't we? We do need someone to protect us. We do need someone to discipline us. I don't know about you guys, but my tendency sometimes is to roam a little bit. And I really thank God that he has that little stick to tap me with. Get me back in the herd, where, or the flock, I should say, where I belong. Shows you how much I know. I don't even know a herd from a flock very much. But, but it's interesting to me that he says, I'm sending you out like sheep. And even in Luke's gospel, the word there is even a little bit more helpless. He uses the word lambs, baby sheep. Talk about being defenseless. And you know, when you look at nature and you see, I love watching nature stuff, but a lot of times when you see the herds or the flocks or whatever they might be that are out there and the lions and the hyenas and all the guys come, the predators come, and they sit up and they look for the strongest, toughest sheep of all. Let's get him. That's not what they do. They look for the weakest They look for the smallest. They look for the one that can't keep up with the flock. They look for the ones who have kind of gone astray a little bit. Those are the ones they pounce on. Those are the ones that they destroy. And so I would think in Jesus' advice right here, one of the most important things he's trying to tell them here is be a little bit smart, be wise, and stay with the flock. Don't get out on your own. There's danger when you go out on your own. There's danger when we veer off onto our own path, away from the shepherd. I'm sending you out like sheep. And then he gives them an example of how they should deal with this problem that they're going to be dealing with. He says, therefore... You know what the word therefore is there for? You always want to ask that question. What's that word therefore there for? It's there so that we can look back to what was just said. I like to say, when I see that word therefore, I like to say, in light of these things that we've read, so therefore, be wise as serpents and be as harmless as a dove. So we've got a lot, of, a lot of farm animals happening here, don't we? We've got a lot of animal stuff happening here. And it's interesting to me that he's kind of using these animals to compare and to teach a lesson to his new apostles, his disciples. Because he knows what lies in wait for them. He knows exactly the fate of each and every one of these men. He knows the cost that will be paid by them to serve the Lord. And I think last Sunday, towards the end of our time together, we kind of went down through the list of the 12 and did a brief summary, if you will, of what happened to these 12. I didn't see any of them getting elected to be a governor or become multimillionaires. I didn't see any of them becoming Hollywood stars. I saw every single one of them dying horrible deaths and losing everything they had for the cause of Christ. And even when it came right down to it, we saw some of them that said, well, if you're going to crucify me, don't do it the way you did the Lord because I'm not worthy of that. You can put me on an upside down cross. You can put me on an X-shaped cross, but not like the one that my Messiah died on. All they had to do is just say, hail Caesar. All they had to do is go into the temples 
of Rome into the Roman city and go into their temple and just burn incense to one of their gods. That's all they had to do. Their families would have been spared. Their lives would have been spared. They would have been welcomed back into the community, if you will. But they didn't do that. As a matter of fact, history tells us that thousands and thousands and thousands of people who claimed the name of Christ in their lives were consumed, destroyed, eaten alive, while thousands of others sat in seats and cheered it on. Many of you will go home today and chill out and go watch football. And you'll see maybe 100,000 people in a stadium. And you'll see men smashing into each other and, you know, beating down one another while everybody is ecstatically cheering. Now, really, I mean, if you think about it, you'd be thinking, oh, that poor guy, look what happened to him. Go make sure he's okay, you know. No, that's not how we respond to that kind of stuff. Somewhere down inside of us is that animal stuff. We like that, you know. We like battle. We like competition. Sometimes people even feed on violence. Well, that's the way it was in the Colosseum. Thousands of people. They say up to 100,000 people would come to the Colosseum to see the game. And the game was all about killing people, mainly Christians. And not just Christian men, okay? They would usually, a lot of times, they would set the men to the side. And they would walk their women out there or their children out there. And then they would turn to the man and say, well, what do you want to do? You still stand behind Christ? You want your family to live? And that man in his heart is saying, Lord, I know my family will live. They'll live forever as long as I don't forsake you. And he would have to watch that happen. And then 99% of the time, he would be next. You see, when we betray the Lord, when we walk away from the Lord, when we strive to get back into the things of the world, there's no safety net there. There's no guarantee of survival there. There's always a breach of contract when you're dealing with evil. You know that, right? No matter what kind of contract I might sign concerning evil things, if it's coming from the world, I can't trust it. Ultimately, the goal here was the downfall of the saints, the downfall of the people who believed in Christ. Why? What was the big deal? All Jesus ever talked about was love. You know that? He always went around healing and feeding and loving people and accepting them right where they were. There wasn't any, hey, go take a bath and get cleaned up before you come in here. There wasn't any of that. I will meet your need right here, whatever your need might be. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean wherever God finds you, that's where he wants you to remain. Some of us, he found us at a very, very low point in our lives. There wasn't a whole lot left. There wasn't a whole lot that was left that was even usable. But yet he came to us, didn't he? He allowed us to come to him and he accepted us just right where we were. But I believe at the same time he's saying, I have good plans for you. I don't want to leave you where you are. I want you to grow. I want you to thrive. I want you to come up out of that pit that you've become so accustomed to so that you can enjoy the fullness of life. And so we have this very, very serious warning. I'm sending you out. And this is how you are to respond. First of all, you're to be wise. You know, the word, are there any snake lovers in here? I might have a couple. I see a couple hands. You know, for the most part, people freak out about snakes. I don't have a problem with snakes unless it's one that's got poison and it bites me. But other than that, I really don't have a problem with snakes. Um, 
But a lot of people look at a snake and they think it's slimy and icky and sneaky and de- de- devious. And Well, I wonder why. I wonder where that came from. I wonder if it might have come from the very, very beginning in the garden where that serpent, the Bible says, was subtle. He was more subtle than the other of God's creatures. He had a, he had a kind of wisdom. He knew how to snake his way in to deceive. He had a great strategy. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that, you know, when you, when you look at this serpent, he wasn't an ugly little snake like you might see going across your driveway. It was an attractive thing to behold. And I'm assuming because of the scripture that it tells us that the snake must have had arms and legs. It probably didn't look like that kind of snake that we would think of today. Because you remember when the curse was given by God to the snake, he said, from now on, you're going to crawl on your belly. Well, I can safely assume that he didn't crawl on his belly prior to that. But all down through history, there's been this this thing about the subtlety of snakes. It's snowing. Anyway, don't leave. You're safe. Now everyone's going to be looking out the window. Close the blinds, everybody. Shouldn't have said that. I couldn't help it. A distraction, yeah. So the NIV uses the word shrewd. Be as shrewd as a snake and be as innocent as a dove. I love that. What a contrast we have. We have sheep and we have doves. Both very innocent, very pure, very harmless. And on the other hand, we have snakes who are very shrewd, very sneaky. But it's interesting that God says, you know... We want you to be as wise as a serpent, but as harmless as a dove. Why would I want anything that had anything to do with the serpent at all? Well, I don't think it had anything to do with the being identifying as a serpent, but I think that part of it was the serpent was wise. He was cautious. He was patient. He would lie and wait until the perfect time. And sometimes we need to be that way too. Sometimes we know when to zip our lip, and sometimes we know when to speak. And most of the time we do it out of turn. Sometimes we think the light's green and we should go, and it's not. I'm impatient. i got to get to where I'm going. I'm not showing that quality of patience and waiting There are some things that Jesus is saying here. There are some things that we can learn from the serpent. Not that we would want to be one, but his tactics are effective. If you can use those tactics and if you can be wise, if you can be cautious, if you can be seeing things through your spirit rather than always through your eyes, through the natural, and be also as gentle as a dove. The Apostle Paul, in the book of Acts, I wanted to read this to you. I'm going to read it from NIV because it's, it's, it puts it very, very clear here. This was Paul writing to the Ephesian church, and he's writing to the elders or pastors of the church, and it's in Acts 20, 28. He says, keep watch over yourselves and all of the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you, and they will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after themselves. So be on your guard, and remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you day and night with tears. So now we got serpents and we got wolves. We have doves. We have lambs. Such a contrast between them all. 
And here's Paul in the early, early church. And this particular three verses that we have here in Acts, there's a lot of interesting aspects to this. First of all, we have a warning. We have an encouragement. We have a job description, if you will. And look what the first one is. Keep watch over yourselves. That's first. I find it interesting that he didn't say keep watch over the flock and then keep watch over yourselves. We have to take care of us first, don't we? We have to keep watch over our own lives as a pastor or a deacon or an elder or a Sunday school teacher or a food hander outer or whatever God has called us to be, a mother, a father, a grandmother, a grandparent. These principles don't just apply to a pastor, although they are, in this case, specific to them. It applies from children all the way up. The Word is encouraging us, first and foremost, we need to take care of our own business first. If I don't know where I'm at in the Lord, if I don't know if I'm strong or weak or if I'm going to fall to temptation or what's going to happen, then how am I going to be able to take care of my family? If I can't even figure out my own relationship with the Lord, how am I going to raise those little ones up in a godly home? You know, if I can't show love in my home... If I can't have a loving relationship with my spouse, do you think that the children are not seeing that? Do we think for a minute that God's pleased with that? And it doesn't stop there. Because those children grow up to be adults. And children that grow up to be adults, many times they do what they're trained to do. Now, that's not something that has to be a for sure thing. I know many people uh, that were raised in an abusive home who grew up and come to realize, I don't have to be like that. I'm going to be different than that. That cycle stops right here with me. But there are many, many others who never see that. They never get there. They always grow up, and if they were abused, then they will abuse. Sad principle, but true. So it starts with mom and dad there. In a church, it starts with the leadership. It starts with the leadership keeping watch. What am I watching for? What do you think as a pastor I'm watching for? I'm looking for the wolf. I'm looking for the serpent. I'm looking for those signs. I'm looking for those red flags that pop up. The Holy Spirit shows me these red flags about even in people's lives. And he would say, you know, the person's really struggling or the family's really struggling. They need your help. They need prayer. Don't discard them. Go after them. Bring them back. Now, for me, that's easy to do. For me, that's really easy. As a matter of fact, for me, that can happen to a fault. A pastor once called me a chaser. He said, Tom, you're a chaser, man. You're more obsessed with chasing the ones that don't want to be fed than you are feeding the ones that are hungry. That's a really easy trap to fall into. Because the thing is, I think in our hearts, we want everyone to do well. We want everyone to thrive and grow. And when we see them flailing and staggering and falling off to the side, we want to go after them. But you know what? There comes a time the Lord says, you know, they're on that raft. They're going down that river of backsliding, and the calm water's not too bad right now. But you know what, Tom? You got to let them go. You got to let the raft run its course. And when it's run its course, and they've crashed and burned on the rocks, and they're laying there with nobody and nothing, and they're injured, then you go to them. You can't get on the raft with them and try to convince them as you're going down the river lest you crash and burn with them. Besides that, you need to take care of the 99. 
But I think first and foremost, we need to look out for our own lives so that we can be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He's made us overseers. Be a shepherd to the church of God, which he bought. This is something we got to remember because, you know, yeah, we started this group with a Bible study in a school. We started with very humble beginnings. We're not a giant mega church, which thank you, Lord, I'm glad of. But we've come a long way, and we've made a difference in people's lives. And there's no way in the world anybody, including me, should stand up here and go, look at what we've done. It's not what we've done. We've just had the privilege to watch God work in our presence and through us. It's his glory. The credit goes to him. Why? Because he purchased us with his own blood. I can be the best pastor in the whole world, and I can't offer you that. Only Jesus can. That's why we all, when it comes to that, we all come to level ground. We all have to bow the knee and say, thank you, Lord, for shedding your blood. Thank you, Lord, for letting me become one of your own. And he knows. He says, after I leave, I know what's going to happen. Savage wolves are going to creep in. And again, as we mentioned earlier this morning, they don't look for the strong ones. They'll go in and start picking off the weak ones in the flock. And Paul is so concerned about this. He even goes as far as to say, there's going to be people in your own little church that are going to turn against you. That's frightening, especially if you've lived it, especially if you've seen it in your life and you've seen that happen. It's really frightening, but it truly can happen. So first of all, he says, keep watch over yourself. And the next thing he says here is be on your guard. Be in the watchtower. Be looking and paying attention to what's going on with your family, what's going on with your heart, what's going on with your relationship with the Lord, what's going on with your peers around you. I had a friend that worked at ADEC for many, many, many years, and every day he would take his Bible to work. And every day at lunchtime, he'd do his little devotional as he was having lunch. And, you know, a lot of the guys that knew him, you know, they would be, you know, behind the stands over there all the time reading his Bible. Oh, man, what's up with that guy? He's some kind of religious fanatic or something like that. And you would think that they looked at that man and they would say, what a waste of time. Why are you doing that? But let me tell you something. When one of their children got sick, or when one of their family died, or when one of them lost their job, or when something terrible happened, they got a disease in their lives, guess who they ran to for prayer? That man. So sometimes it's easy for us to see the mockers on the outside, and harder to see what God's really doing behind the scenes. But I believe if we remain faithful on that little tiny calling that he had, And no matter how people seem to be responding to it, they'll come that day when they're going to need God. And they're going to say, I know that's a godly man over there. That's where I'm going for help. So be shrewd and be innocent, he says. I love doves, don't you? We have a couple of married doves. I suppose they're married. Seems like the same two ones come to our house every year and they hang out. And and then one year, only one of them showed up. And I thought, oh, he must have lost his wife or her husband or something, you know. I was sad because the little dove would be up there on the tree all by by himself. The other lovebirds, you know, that all be doing their thing, and the dove was alone. Well, I have to tell you, this year, showed up with a new partner. <laughs> I was really happy to see that. <laughs> you can only mourn for so long. Sometimes we just have to pick the, the things up and move forward. It says in verse 17 to be on your guard because they're going to hand you over. 
They will hand you over. What are they going to hand you over to? They'll deliver you up to councils, and they will scourge you in the synagogue. Well, you know what the synagogue is? It's the Jewish church. If we were all Jews, this would be called a synagogue, all right? Now, this still happens in churches today, believe it or not. This happens in churches where somebody who might be struggling, they will bring them up in front of the people and humiliate them in front of everybody and get them to confess or, or kick them out of the family because they're struggling in some area. Maybe they had a marriage separation and now both of them are being thrown out. And Does that sound like Jesus to you? It doesn't sound like Jesus to me at all. But this is what he said going to happen, and it does happen even to this day. And it even goes a little bit further when he talks about flogging and scourging. Man, that was a tough deal. You know, in the early days, when, it, when the early days, uh, oh, this, this, command, this, this command of scourging um, was specifically Jewish. And, yeah, they worship, they they you know, hung out as a community there. But there was the council of elders, and they would find somebody breaking the law, and they would bring them in. And in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 2, it says, If a guilty man deserves to be beaten, the judge will make him lie down and have him flogged in his presence with the number of lashes in his crime that, de that it deserves. But he must not give him more than 40 lashes. If he's flogged more than 40, more than that, your brother will be degraded in your eyes. This was the law, primarily because not many human beings would survive much more than 40 lashes. Now, Barnes, the commentator Barnes says this instrument was uh, formerly was used as a rod, a stick, uh, maybe a bamboo stick. And afterward, they would employ thongs or leather lashes that were attached to the rod, like a whip, but many of them. To make the blows more severe and more painful, they sometimes would fasten a sharp piece of iron or a sharp piece of stone or lead to the thong. These were called scorpions, aptly named. And the law was expressed that the number of stripes should not exceed 40. But the Jews really came up with an ingenious idea here. In order to get the process done quicker, in order to secure a more accurate counting, they would use these uh, instruments with maybe three or maybe four of these long lashes hanging down off of them. So that every time he would hit you, it would be four, and it would be eight, and it would be on and on until 40, which got you there a lot quicker than if you were getting them one at a time. Interesting how people do that. So 13 strikes of three would bring them to 39 blows. Now, here's something for you, okay, as ugly as this sounds. This happened to Paul Five times. Not once. Five. Matter of fact, one time he was so hurt that they drug him outside the city, left him in the dirt, thought he was dead. He took a really bad beating. <laughs> this will show you the heart of Paul. When he woke up, when he was conscious, when he was able to open his eyes and get up, he didn't say, okay, let's go to the next town. No, he got up and he went right back into the same town where they had just beat him. I would look at that and say, Paul, I thought you were smart, <laughs> right? You're a glutton for punishment. But no, Paul, now does that mean that every time we get abused, we should go back for more? Does that set a new precedent in the Bible, a doctrine, that we should get all the abuse we can? You know, you didn't hit me hard enough last time. I've come back for more. I don't believe that that's the case at all. But in Paul's case, it was making a statement. He was making a testimony. He says in verse 18, on my account, 
You'll be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you will speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. I love that. For it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your father who speaks in you. Now, some people have looked at that and they thought to themselves, well, does this apply in my witnessing? Does this apply if somebody comes up and says something derogatory to me about my faith? Or does this come up when I feel the Holy Spirit saying, I want you to share the gospel, and you say, uh, I don't know what to say. The Bible is very, very clear. It's very clear that the Holy Spirit will speak through you. What Jesus is saying here is, you don't need to get some big legal document expressing your innocence with a long bunch of words on it in order to hand it over to your accusers to find you not guilty. You don't do that. You don't need to do that. He says, you just go in there and trust the Lord, and he'll give you words to say. It's a principle that works. But yet again, as most things in the Bible, people have taken this out of context. There have been many pastors, many preachers, many church leaders who have interpreted this to mean that you don't have to prepare for your sermons. You don't have to study for your sermon. You just go up there and just let the Holy Spirit channel through you, and it'll just come out, right? Is there any truth to that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't tell you how many times I've been up here with you, and I've got my notes. I try to stay with them. But there's a lot of times when the Holy Spirit says, "Up, oh, I want you to kind of make a left turn here and go down here for a little while. The thing is, learning to be obedient to that, learning to say, okay, was that the pizza I ate last night, or is that the Holy Spirit? You know? Truly, God does want us to study. Truly, God does want us to be in the Word. He does want us to have organized thoughts. He doesn't want the teachers in the Bible to be willy-nilly, if you will, whatever happens to come at the moment. That's why I'm thankful that what we do here by going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, it keeps me right where I need to be. And I told people last week we were talking about, I said, and you know the great thing about this? I don't have to worry about what I'm going to teach on next week. Or the week after. I just turn the page and see what's next. And that's what we do, right? I've known pastors over the years. I don't know what I'm going to do next Sunday. I feel like I've taught on everything there is to teach on and done every seminar I can do. And now I'm really at a loss for words. And I'll say, why don't you just open up your Bible and teach from the Bible? Isn't that enough? 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman, not a vacationer, but a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Verse 21 is very disturbing. Brother will deliver up brother to death and father his children, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by, by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Brother, it's one thing to be flogged in the synagogue. It's another thing to be betrayed by family. It's one thing to face a death sentence from a governor. But it's another thing, much more tragic, uh, to face death by another family member. Sadly enough, these things happen. Sadly enough, it goes on. Maybe not to the point of death, but without a raise of hands, please. How many of us in here have come to odds with members in our family because of our faith? You know, sometimes Thanksgiving dinner is not so great. Sometimes you have to have stringent rules. We don't talk about religion or politics. Well, they didn't say I couldn't talk about Jesus. He's not religion, right? Try that and see how that goes over. (laughs) But you see, even in our family unit, people are like, nope, don't go there. 
I want to be your brother, but don't push me away like that. Tragic. And then when you get over some of the other countries and some of the other cultures where truly religion causes war, it causes civil conflict, it causes family conflict, all the way from the richest to the poorest. Conflicts in Ireland over church stuff. Gone on forever and ever. Conflicts, death, destruction, like the slaughter that happens in the Sudan. How Islamic fundamentalism has a goal of wiping out every single Christian on the earth. Why? Because we don't agree. They don't agree. We don't agree. And they would like to silence us. A man named Wes Bentley was on a mission to Sudan and tells the story of a young man who accepted Christ. A Sudan young man. And within days, his headless body was found on the side of the road. They found out later he was murdered by his own family turned against the faith. Wow. I'm glad that doesn't happen at my Thanksgiving dinners, right? Or when I get around my family. And when it says here that all men will hate you because of me, it doesn't mean that every single man's going to hate you. What it means is all different kinds of people will hate you. People at your job, people in your entertainment world, All kinds of people from every area. But yeah, that's kind of scary. But Jesus is telling his followers to be faithful in the midst of tribulation, to endure in the midst of persecution, and to persevere to the end, to never give up. Now, for some, the end might be the end of persecution, and for others, the end might be death. But either way, we are to persevere until the end, however that may play out. Could be natural death. Who knows? The point is, Jesus is saying to them, he's saying to you, he's saying to me, don't give up. Don't cave in. Don't deny your faith. Don't backslide. Never apologize for who you are. Never deny Jesus for the sake of your own life. Hang in there. It will end soon. Eternal life is of more value than temporal life, and you will be saved. You know, we have people that we love so much, and we watch them become ill, and we pray God heal them. God, please touch their body, heal them. And we continue to watch them as they deteriorate. I think one of my closest friends in the whole world right now is very close to death. A great man. But you know, when he takes his last breath, he'll be in the presence of the Lord. He will experience the ultimate healing. Amen? Amen? That's really what it's about. And not only will we be healed of sickness, but we'll be healed of that nasty, fleshy nature that we have, that sinful nature that hounds us all through life, the one that we're doing battle with constantly as long as we're in these bodies. That will come to an end when we find ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Now, again, you know, there's always extremes to these things that we look at in the Word, and there are some people who enjoy being persecuted. They think it means that they're spiritual. You know, I used to live in San Diego many years ago, and it was a lot of fun on Thursday afternoon to get on the bus and go to the stadium. They had the Thursday afternoon businessmen baseball game. And it was real close to where I used to live, so I could take a bus to get there. And it's like $2 to get in. You could sit anywhere you want. It was great. It usually happened during 
you know, lunch hour time or whatever. And, but there was this woman, okay, who would get on the bus, and she was a regular. She would get on the bus, and then she would start howling and yelling and vibrating and prophesying and telling everybody about hellfire. And I mean literally acting like a fool. And then when somebody would look at her and say, would you please just sit down and shut up? Oh, I'm being persecuted for the Lord, she would say. <laughs> Hallelujah. No, you're not being persecuted. You're being an idiot. <laughs> you ever met anybody like that? They won't lay off. It's one thing to be persecuted for the sake of a gospel, but it's another one. It's another thing to be persecuted for being obnoxious. It's another thing to be persecuted for being disrespectful or judgmental or inconsiderate or argumentative. That seems to be what comes out in that kind of a situation. Where's the love? Where's the forgiveness? No, there's none there. It's just boasting, pride, resent. Well, on the other hand, let's see what the Bible says about that. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, In your heart... Set apart Christ as the Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give them the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against you, that your good behavior might make them ashamed. Wow, that's kind of a contrast, isn't it? And here's the thing I also notice in this passage. It says, whoever asks you a question. It doesn't tell you to get on the bus and start yelling at everybody on the bus. It says, if somebody comes to you while you're on the bus and asks you a question. I love that. It's a great strategy. He did not deny the reality that persecution was possible and probable. As a matter of fact, he taught them that he was going to take the ultimate example, that he was going to lay down his life. So he tells them as they go into these cities, he says, hey, you know, a disciple is not above his teacher. Verse 25, when they persecute you in one city, be, just flee and go to another. For surely I say, you will have not gone through all the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. There's a lot of work to be done. Sometimes I think we waste our words and our efforts and our hearts on another heart that is so hardened that we'll never be able to crack it. It could be family members, people at work, it could be whatever. But sometimes the Holy Spirit says, you know what? Their hearts are hardened. I want you to let that be and go find someone whose heart is broken so that they're sensitive to the message. Pharaoh had this opportunity over and over and over again. But he continued to harden his heart against God. And every time Moses would come and say, you know what, all you got to do is just let my people go. I'm not going to let your people go. The Bible says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart against Moses and said no. But then there came that time in the process where it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. You want to have a hard heart? You just keep on working on that hard heart. And God one day will just say, well, if that's what you want, that's what you get. Be careful what you ask for. And there are those out there that their hearts are so hard, there's no way they will ever be receptive to my words. I can walk away thinking, I'm a crummy witnesser. I must not know enough about the Bible to get through that person. Well, no, that's not the truth. The truth is it takes the Holy Spirit to break through that person. It takes that person's heart to be in a certain place where the Holy Spirit can break through. You have friends, neighbors, family. You feel like they're blind. Everything you tell them, they can't figure it out at all. They can't comprehend it. You know why they're blind? Because Satan has blinded their eyes. That's what Paul said. So from a strategic point of view, I would think, well, okay, before I approach this blind, hardened person, 
I'm going to pray and ask God to bind the enemy in that person's life so that his eyes can be opened, so that he can see and receive. As long as the eyes are closed, as long as the enemy is keeping them closed, our words fall to the ground. Jesus said a student's not above his teacher or above his master, and the opposite's true. The master, the, te- the student is not above the master, the master's not above the teacher. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm accountable to the same things that I'm holding you accountable to. I think that's awesome that Jesus would say that. It brings him right down there with us. If I'm going to tell you to be accountable and to watch, if I'm going to tell you to keep your eyes open and to pray, I'm going to be accountable to do the same thing. Nobody outgrows that stuff. There's no supervisors. We're all doing the same thing together. And if someone doesn't want to listen to you, just, you know, move on. Maybe at a more convenient time. We don't know. He mentions the word Beelzebub in our text here. Beelzebub's an interesting character. He was the lord of the fly. He was a god that was worshipped by the Philistine people. Why was he the Lord of the fly? Because they had so many darn flies, they had hoped that Beelzebub would kill some of them off. Since he was the Lord over them, he might have mercy on the people and lighten the load of flies. So they worshipped him. What a dumb, dumb thing. See how desperate we get when we stray away from truth, when we get away from the word of God? Worshiping other gods, how futile it is. And the hilarious thing about that is during the time of Moses, every time one of these things would be pronounced upon Egypt, the sorcerers would come up and they would conjure up more of the same. Oh, there's going to be a plague of frogs. And the sorcerers say, hey, we know how to make a plague of frogs. We can do that too. Watch this. And so they make a plague of frogs. And now the frogs are twice as much as before. They did that over and over and over again. Because it was a battle of the gods. Whose God truly is God? Whose God is the God of heaven? And Pharaoh eventually found out who that was. Why don't we have the worship team please come up uh, and I'll wrap this up. Verse 26, Jesus said, do not be afraid of them. He's not promising us that we'll be exempt from misunderstanding or trials. He's not promising us that we won't have persecution or trouble. He's not denying reality but he's encouraging us to not be afraid. We have the greatest warrior in the universe fighting on our side. Amen? You believe that today? I do too. 1 Peter 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears, listen, his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Don't fear what they fear and do not be frightened. Hebrews 13, let your character or your moral disposition be free from love of money, greed, lust, and craving for earthly possessions, and be satisfied with your present circumstances. For God himself has said, I will not in any way fail you, nor give you up, nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, or forsake you, nor let you down, nor relax my hold on you, assuredly not. So we take comfort, and we are encouraged, and we confidently and boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be seized with alarm. I will not fear or dread or be terrified. What can man do to me? Wow, I love that mindset, don't you? Amen.
This morning, if you need prayer, uh, Chris and Lonnie are with us over here this morning. They would love to be able to pray with you. And uh, I've kept you a little bit over today, but that's okay. Um, If you want to spend a few more minutes here and hang out and need to have prayer, maybe you're struggling in some of these areas I'm talking about. You know, it's a good thing, because look at what I just read to you. God will hear your prayer. He's attentive to your prayer. He wants to hear from you. Let's pray. Father, these are great words today. Great, great strategy. A great knowledge, Lord, that you're the one in control. Oh, there's a lot of saber rattling and a lot of threatening and a lot of words that get thrown around. Even in heartache and loss. But Lord, even now, even this very moment, we know that you are attentive to our prayer. Because God, our hearts are to be righteous. Our hearts are to be the ones on the lookout over our own lives and our families, the friends and family that we have around us, over our church, over your work, to protect your lambs from the enemy. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to have insight to these things. Lord, help us to see through the eyes of the Spirit more than through the eyes of the flesh. Oh, God, help us to do that. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, and by the way, there will be food, I believe, down in the sanctuary or the fellowship hall. Thanks. I praise you I'm never running out of
never running out of words to thank you. God, I thank you. And I can't help this obsession. song of the land. 